My name is Kaisha Gabriel, and I'm the North America Field Marketing Manager for Kelton Tech. Today, we are going to be discussing a successful hybrid implementation. It's part two of our webinar series, and we're going to be focusing on the architecture and the building blocks for success. So I'm honored to have with me today Ravi, our e-commerce solution expert. He's based out of Chicago and got his start in digital transformation more than a decade ago. Um, he has been creating e-commerce ecosystems for retailers, distributors, manufacturers, um, using vendor and bespoke platforms, and he has a passion for developing solutions, tools, and techniques to deliver maximum return on investment. So we're super excited to hear uh, Ravi share his expertise with us today. Before we get started, I wanted to go over just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions during your presentation, if you'll just type them in the Q&A section of your control panel, we will um, be happy to address them at the end of the webinar. If we don't have time to get to all of the questions, don't worry, we will respond via email if that's the case. And as a reminder to everyone, we are recording this session, so we will be sending that out after the webinar um, in the following days so you can review it and share it with colleagues if you'd like. Um, I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Kevin Houston, our Senior Vice President, who's going to provide a brief corporate overview. Kevin? Thank you, Kaisha. Uh, next slide, Ravi. I appreciate everyone joining us this morning. As Kaisha mentioned, we're very excited to have you with us today. A brief overview, and I'll take just a moment of Kelton just to give you some context, and then we'll move on with our presentation with Ravi. Kelton Tech was founded in 2009. We are a pioneer of digital transformation for this past decade. With operations in the US, UK and I, and Asia Pacific, our clients range from startups to Fortune 500, with a core strength supported through our ISO 9001 certification and CMII Level 5 compliance. We're 1,500 employees strong and a publicly traded company. Next slide. Elton Tech is a new age global IT services consulting company. We design, develop, and operate digital technologies that create new business models for our clients. These digital services cross six major pillars. Number one, digital systems themselves, where our digital services span IoT, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud-based solutions. Number two, the digital connected enterprise. Here, we provide integration services in support of your digital systems. Number three, the systems of record. These are enterprise application services typically across both SAP, Oracle, and Microsoft solutions. And fourthly, OPD or outsource product development. Our product development and support services follow agile um, development methods. And number five, and why we are gathered here today is our digital commerce and marketing area of business. This is delivering omni-channel e-commerce solutions focused on improving overall customer experience. And sixth and lastly, our IoT-enabled platform solutions. These IoT solutions are uh, developed for the oil and gas and manufacturing industry. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Ravi so again we can dive deeper into our webinar series today within our digital commerce and marketing focus. Ravi? Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it and good morning, everyone. And uh, so let me take your attention uh, to the subject of the webinar. We are going to talk about today about uh, hybrid architecture and its building blocks. And so before I uh, jump into the nitty gritty of uh, a, the architecture about hybrids, a, we have to spend some time to understand that why it is critical a for a, the organization, those who invest into this technology are the ones, those who are looking to invest in any platform. Why it is so critical to know about that uh, the architecture a, on which the baseline a platform is built upon. So a, overall, a, there are several benefits uh, for a, uh, understanding the underpinning and know-how of the architecture, the way it works is. Uh, first and foremost, 
think the way I look at it that this is critical to business survival and success. As you start organization, they know that underneath and along with all of their peripheral systems, and also, you know, they are planning for any future investment or enhancement so that uh, they can successfully adopt the business processes as per the need of the customers. They need to know that, you know, what technology platform uh, the acquisition is uh, going to be. Uh, part two is uh, uh, managing innovation within the enterprise. Uh, a, a, an organization will, will always stay away from technologies which are obsolete. So uh, knowing that you know, platform and uh, what technology it is based on, it also gives enterprises an edge to know that the technology they are going to invest, they are futuristic so that uh, they actually participate into the innovation, also taking their business to the next level. And uh, third is, uh, since uh, a, along with uh, a technology adoption, as the businesses, they go live, a after effect of uh, those adoptions are that there are going to be recurring operation cost. So any investment in the technology and the architecture a, the, the more an architecture is nimble, the less a hassle it would be to a, operate upon. So, so this, is, this go hand in hand for organization to decide that the technology we are going after, you know, how consolidated that technology is, so that my post live operations are in sync with uh, a, what part one is that it should be easier to manage part two that I should not be spending too much money to maintain a, that environment. A last, a, as we all know that uh, none of the businesses, they are static with the emerging demands from the customer as well as uh, even, you know, from their own needs, you know, they, all, they always overhaul their business processes. So there is always a time when a, out of the box investments, uh, they take an organization uh, to a certain degree of uh, their customer success. Uh, what means a lot is that they actually customize according to their brands, according to their user experience, according to what is critical to their customer so that they can actually drive uh, this technology so that you know, they can eventually uh, go and win over their customers. So, so, so meaning is that uh, it need to be a faster time to market, you know, any of the things. So the more you know about the architecture, the more you know about the product you are investing in, uh, the better uh, it looks like that, you know, where my, how, how it works and how does it integrate with all my peripheral systems. So in short, uh, overall, this is all about the better you know about it, the more you will get comfortable to use it. <clears throat> so before, uh, so the way, I, uh, the way I look at it, you know, whenever we talk about architecture, there, it means a lot to many different people. You know, when we talk to a person who is managing a project versus a person who is a, is a business domain expert versus someone who is pure technical person, versus someone in the C in a C rank, you know, for them, every, it, the term architecture means very different for all of them. So, so, so I think one part is uh, where uh, we must uh, put a perspective that, you know, what does it mean to a person who comes from a business orientation that what does it mean for a, an architecture standpoint of versus the one who is going to maybe looking into the infrastructure versus the someone who is looking into the capacity utilization or someone who is going to eventually going to use that architecture for application enhancement. So I have uh, divided uh, this into that there are three uh, main classifications of those architecture perspectives. One is purely where a, the businesses, they actually can take a look at it and they can say, okay, you know, this is the capability model of an architecture is, it goes hand in hand with what I'm looking today, as well as, you know, what I might be 
uh, taking it to further for my future uh, use. So this is uh, the business architecture. Part two is uh, logically, how does it fit in? A lot of uh, a business analysts or a lot of managers, those who are looking at a technology, uh, they may not be uh, they may not be uh, knowing too much about the underpinning uh, all the you know gears and wheels which are moving, uh, but they would like to know that you know what this is all about. Uh, so that is all about the logical view of the architecture. I'm going to talk about it. That will contain information, application, uh, what services, integrations is, and the infrastructure of the deployment stuff. Now, when we go at a level where a, most of our mm, you, you know, team, which are, which are developers, the ones, those who are systems analysts, those who are technical leads, uh, they need a uh, lot more detailed information about uh, that. What are the data models are? What are the application models look like? So, you know how I'm going to develop it. What are the design patterns are going to be? What execution models? You know I will be looking from the communication standpoint of view. How it is operationally going to be structured? Uh, what are the network topology? does it support or it does not support and what kind of uh, a, you know principles and the guidelines i should be put in place so that they all work together what the security means to me you know does it is it a saml based versus oauth based versus anything when i'm communicating on my transactions just like those who are a, those are private transactions uh, maybe a credit card or maybe something which we don't want to expose it to the network, you know, how those security measures should take place and how should I uh, put it uh, as part of uh, so that I get in compliance with, uh, there are many, you know, GDPR, you know, payment compliance. So, so all of those things contained in, in, in the security models. So, so having said that, uh, so this is the stepping or the stage where we should start looking into these classification of uh, architectures. So let's move on. So let's uh, first see from the perspective of uh, business uh, architecture and the business uh, modeling. So for that, a, a, a capability model a, does a lot goes a lot further from the perspective of that when a business stakeholder is looking into that, that business stakeholder questions arises out of uh, that, okay, how can I drive my unique online shopping experience for this segment of my customers? A, how I'm going to run a, my marketing campaigns for this particular merchandise which I'm launching in the summers versus the Christmas time or, or some other time. So they actually want to know also like uh, what the customer's feed is, you know, what, uh, what product, what customers are talking about or their products. So, so this is, these, uh, uh, these are a, questions as well as the capabilities of a platform where the business stakeholder, you know, feel comfortable in learning and seeing from the perspective of that, how they are going to uh, satisfy the need of their customers. So let's start with uh, talking about online shopping. So user experience is very critical to the business stakeholders. And uh, the way we view within Kelton and the way we see and uh, the way we specialized in creating those user experience from business strategy perspective is that we work with and we, we see and any organization, you know, they, they actually uh, drive those things from two, uh, two perspectives. You know, one is purely from their branding a recognition how a customer is going to view that brand. So they are going to create that experience based on the brand. Another is the personas of the customers they actually deal with. A, in a construction company, you know, who is a supplier of uh, material to a construction, whether it is a, 
a construction material versus anything else. So they tailor their experience based on whether it is going to a, this, this material is going to, or this product is going to be viewed by a person who is a constructor versus a supervisor versus someone who is actually going to visit and uh, work in the compliance industry. So overall, all the personas, uh, you know, that drives as well, the user experience along with your branding. Search and browse, card checkout, merchandising, this is all for product management. A personalization, content management, web portal. And uh, so looking into the managing side of uh, those master data management, where product and pricing, loyalty management, you know, then we talk about channel integration, where, you know, how they are going to be integrated with our partner application, how they are going to be integrated with our in-store apps, how the uh, mobile experience is going to emerge, you know, mobility, you know, how it is going to, a uh, probably you know go from our a uh, supply chain integration perspective as well so these are a this is a view we are we are um, at the time when we are having discussions with the uh, with the business stakeholder these are these are the critical capability models which can be expanded and and maybe a uh, versions you know from uh, from five version to all the way to hybrid six seven to all the way to the next generation of, uh, they may keep on expanding. So the, this model will keep on evolving so that uh, they actually see the latest uh, view of the capability provided by the hybrids. So moving to uh, logical architecture. So this is, uh, a, this you can actually uh, see in this uh, slide, a, all the a technical, at a logical level of the platform, what does it provide? So I will be spending a lot of time on this one since this is a very comprehensive a view of uh, the platform is. Uh, just uh, taking an example is uh, if suppose uh, we, are, we are here, uh, data models, you know, data modeling, how a hybrid handle data modeling, you know, how hybrids actually do the data abstraction of legacy data. Just take an example, uh, we are all in a situation when we are actually looking for omni-channel solutions that anything our master data sources, in this case, let's say pro product or customer data, which is created in our ERP system, whatever ERP system we have, we have SAP or we have Oracle or we have Erie Edwards, any system we talk about, they maintain those master data entities. So consuming that data and how it actually come to hybrid, this is about data abstraction. So so simple example can be how I consume a product I dock or a customer eye dog into hybrids. So then uh, let's see this ETL and then how web services, you know, third party legacy, all these adapters. So this is uh, a, into the information integration perspective. So, so, so the example I took here is so that uh, uh, before we start uh, go and uh, uh, you know, peeling it off, uh, we first, I just want to uh, go and uh, explain a little bit about how those boxes has been put in place. So the, so, so this green box right at the bottom is uh, all about uh, that what are the sources or the repositories are. So this is uh, a, a, a the lowest level where infrastructure uh, does connect with our, uh, our sources where we keep the data. And uh, the next uh, a level sitting on top of it is uh, how do I actually construct my information uh, from those sources as well as a third party or my peripheral systems, those who contribute to the data. The example I gave was the product and the customer and the orders. You know, we take the orders, we submit those orders. So, but from the perspective of information, a, how do we collate the information from different sources 
and also a uh, collating from our in uh, for our for our for our in a uh, in source repositories on which uh, your hybris platform is based on and provide a single view to the customer so that they can actually uh, see not it doesn't matter you know from where the information is coming from so this information integration layer uh, is uh, coordinating uh, all the activities with uh, several uh, specific uh, services just like uh, in hybris we uh, talk about uh, content management services so you know which is all about uh, how do we manage our you know a, all the forms you know how do i manage all the pages how do i manage uh, my website how do i manage my content slot so these are the all the content related services we have uh, many services which are a management uh, of the data and other services business services is all about uh, you know these are the core services so Many of you uh, have worked with Hybris are the ones those who are looking for it. Uh, in the platform, you know, you are talking about persistence, you know, service or the caching service uh, or a security service and how a scheduler works so that you can run your cron jobs. And uh, so how you are going to deploy, you know, a you know, deployment services, how does it work uh, in terms of the synchronization when you are moving a, some of your items from one catalog to another. A, so these are all a, services uh, pertains to that part. So now moving into a, when we are actually reading our, any of the data, there is always a need that we need to either translate the data or transform the data. So we have uh, those services, you know, as uh, you you guys must have seen you know what those uh, converters are what those populators are a uh, one very good example is you know when we are integrating and uh, out of the box uh, hybris integrate very well with apache solar where indexing as well as the creation of all the documents whatever pertains to your product catalog yeah uh, it seamlessly create those indexes and uh, with the, the you, uh, search and browsing experience, you know, those transformation internally happens because the data which is coming from those, uh, uh, our Apache uh, solar in the form of a document that gets converted into the Java beans eventually get rendered on the page. So just uh, want to uh, give uh, that example in favor of what transformation here is. And also, you know, whenever we are fetching anything from our metadata services perspective, you know, how, uh, how those services uh, get translated into uh, the front edge of the application before it get rendered on the viewable area, whether it is your web application or a mobile application. Then there are many interaction services, you know, personalization, there is a customization, transporting, navigation. So, so this tier uh, explains you logically uh, what does it mean for my application and what those services been provided. Now, sitting on top of it is the composition, you know, just like uh, now if you see there is a layer which is my repository information layer, then there, my, there is my business layer, and then sitting on top is facade, you know, or pattern, you know, where everything is happening uh, so that I can actually compo I can compose uh, from different services and then from my business process standpoint of view, you know, just take an example, if I'm on a product display page, a product display page uh, going and collect information from many, many different business services. You know, it will may go and fetch your product information from hybrids for the pers perspective of uh, inventory as well as the pricing. It is going into hitting SAP or any other ERP system. And uh, when it comes down to showing you images, you know, it may be fetching those images from a AWS or, or from a local repository. 
And from a reviews perspective, it may be, you know, looking and go into a, some third party reviews. A, so, so the meaning here is the composition is where all of your real time data is being fetched from your underneath applicant services and uh, with many and raise many of the events, uh, many of the message transformation happens. But eventually what you see is that you are actually composing that data so that you can present that data in a unit format uh, to your presentation services, which is at the top. So from the composition services, when we come to the presentation of it, you know, presentation is where the concept of omni-channel emerge because if suppose a, you are on a point of sale system versus you are on a web, a web experience when it is running on a browser or versus it is running as your native a, application on the mobile services or you are instrumenting it as your REST-based ends where any of your a custom application can actually go and call those RESTful services or even SOAP-based service, web services. And uh, then comes down to that, how your a customer service wrap, you know, sales wrap, you know, those are the applications you're building so that your field forces, they can actually a, make use of those composite services a, maybe a good example, maybe uh, your CSR, you know, when they are taking, you know, queries from your customers, you know, they are always looking and want to find out the order status because the one question most of the customer they are going to call is customer services, you know, I haven't received my order yet, you know, can you please find it out where it is stuck, you know, and then CSR will go and maybe uh, from, it will start from your order and then find it out, okay, you know, this was supposed to deliver this FedEx they, they go through the delivery service and find it out the status. So, so overall, those are all the presentation side of it. So now on the right hand side, a, since all of these things uh, are tied into the hybrid life cycle, whether we are into the design phase or assembly deployment or a under monitor, so these are the services which are life cycle oriented services are. So we, we have seen uh, in hybrid just like a catalog, a product may, if, if this product is not active, you know, you, it will not be synchronized. You know, if it is not approved, this will not be synchronized. So the, these are some a very business focused a, a life cycle of your product as well as life cycle of your application, the way it should behave. On the left is all about uh, indexing to your, a, any underneath uh, a search engine and with the a hybrid bundled with uh, a Apache Solar, but I have seen clients, you know, those who are using a different uh, indexing engine as well. So this is, so overall when we now bring everything together here is, a, this is uh, a talk a lot from the perspective of that, what is the framework of the pieces which logically fits? And I can see that, you know, from the technology standpoint of what the data modeling means. So, so the critical part here is uh, that the data modeling is a logical representation from the architecture perspective. And uh, then the view of uh, technology architect will take you to the next level. So I will be going back and forth uh, on this slide so that I can connect a, a, a technology end of hybrids to a logical end. And uh, when we look at that, how it may actually uh, go back and dovetail with a business architect, you know, they may not see the, all the nitty gritty, the, how the data is flowing between those different uh, capabilities. But what matters to them is that, you know, they can actually, their customers can see the order history, you know, that's what matters. And uh, when we are talking about here is like, okay, my product, uh, it actually out of the box does not have 
the features or attributes which I want to do and I have to extend it. So there is a technology side of it, which is uh, which I'm going to talk a little bit in, in next few minutes. Uh, but the logical representation is this way. So just want to uh, make a distinction, very clear distinction that how those views, you know, I, I, they are actually very similar to the user experience, how those views are catered uh, to the community uh, within an organization. Okay, so moving from here, when we now see a, a now this is a purely from the perspective of uh, technology side of the thing here is, so we will go and peel it off uh, a, and here, a, let's uh, talk about uh, simply, a, you know, how a request a, when I'm either, it um, doesn't matter whether it is my mobile device or I'm, I'm on a web page. So let's assume that I'm on a web page, you know, I am browsing, searching, you know, coming to PDB page. So how does actually it, uh, it's working from the technology uh, side of the equation? So, uh, so if we see that uh, uh, simply, you know, there is a servlet engine. So this servlet engine, uh, which we call it uh, basically our Tomcat. So within Tomcat, a JVM, a, there are many component, you know, they are at a high level. There are many component, those who are working together to make this happen. And uh, here a, on the top, you know, I can have my, a, an, an application, or I can have uh, my other managed application. So the way I logically, if, if I go back here, if I see here the top part, what I'm talking about is that uh, a, my presentation layer where I was talking about thick client, thin client, B2B, all of those things. And then I also had another box where sales wrap out. So, so you guys uh, actually, uh, if we can all translate these two boxes into that, this application and other application. Now, when I talk about uh, this servlet engine, uh, you can think of your composition services, your application services, your integration, uh, information integration services. Uh, this all box, uh, all three boxes, they actually map to this servlet engine. Uh, since uh, everything is running within the Java JVM, uh, which our Tomcat uh, you know, server is using. So, so let's now uh, talk about you know what these components are and uh, how do they interact with each other each other to service the requests and uh, just take an example here is uh, so the first uh, top from the application uh, any web page or the request goes uh, so it goes to a, a facade service which is a business service and uh, and then underneath uh, those business service has many other business services so here, if you see, I have a named it as a composite service, which stands for C. And here, these are the composite services are, which is uh, exactly a, what I was talking about here, the composite services layer. And then I have here, B is all about those business services. So the business services uh, is all about, then the interfaces is how they are interacting with the model services in the data bus. So, so coming back again here is that my, a, my basically service for search may be a, a search facade service, okay? And then within search, I will be having a, a product search service or facet search service. And then it is going to go a, to a solar engine where the solar is going to make a request and come back. And then when I'm on the PDB page, it may be asking a model service that, okay, you know, get me the detail of this product with ID this, you know, and then a model service is uh, going to go and get all the information from the persistence engine and, uh, and serve it there. So there are a few things which stand out out of this uh, technology architect. One part is, that uh, what those uh, components are made up of. Your, when we look at the model services with a hybrid, so hybrid uh, model services are very similar to a EJB3 model. It's a, it's a, it's a proprietary engine a, where it actually does your transaction management, where it does your 
a all persistent management uh, so that is the responsibility of uh, a, as well as the security transactional standpoint of view so the model services uh, cater to that part of uh, your uh, your engine now a uh, model services uh, you know they are exposed uh, with your business services and now any of the business or a composite services which i was talking about uh, they all use spring based injection framework so i'm so since we are all here and come from uh, the background where we are all either developer architect so it's it's not a new phenomenon because spring is there for for over a decade and uh, everybody knows about it so it's a it's a dependency injection framework where services you know they can be a connected or associated to each other through a injection either through a constructor or through get or set or those kind of things so 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 hybris a, but what we need to learn is that hybris use a all about uh, many 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 you know spring based uh, functionality so spring core is uh, their main uh, engine where they use uh, for their business composition now coming back to a uh, how does uh, a all of those uh, a, from the front end standpoint what does it work so spring has uh, another part spring mvc and uh, so hybris uses the spring mvc engine so that uh, you know they can mm, tailor to any of the request with all filter and everything and before the response can be rendered uh, to uh, your applications so then uh, you know on the on the left hand side you know activity monitoring governance uh, all of all of those things. so this is uh, this is a shell of uh, a, at a at at a at a high level that how does uh, this work so now we will be going into each of those things and start looking into that what does it mean from the perspective of uh, more granular level of the knowledge so next slide is very busy so i i is very difficult uh, because there was there are a lot of uh, a stuff i wanted to put in here uh, but what is critical here is first is that uh, you will see that what's been a what's been shown here from the from the layered perspective and here being decomposed into the tech technology end of the equation here i am showing in a uml diagram that how that tier structure works so from external on the left hand side uh, over here uh, it's, it's and i have no ability actually to zoom it you know my apologies uh, to to the gateway to a uh, interface uh, then to the services the integration information and all those those kind of things so at the end you know it pretty much uh, you know show one level down of uh, similar thing but in a more component uml fashion so that all of these components which participate in that so uh, so what i will do is uh, uh, this when you have have it probably you know you will have the ability to uh, zoom a little more when you see this video and uh, but at this time i do not have that ability with me so let's uh, move on and uh, i can talk about this in my uh, successive slides so uh, so when i see, when you see that you know a service or this so in hybris case you know everything is all about a, an extension and module so that fits into a giving from your perspective of business value chain that pro, how does a product is how does that module is and this is the way all of those extensions and then extensions they get together to make a accelerator don't want to you know this is again a view to simplify understand that when i'm developing these cases you know when i'm looking at this component a, what does it mean from the hybrid standpoint of the hybrid module or hybrid section so that's what it does mean so a so now a, since i was talking about uh, that what does a, when we are here this is at a highest level you see an application broken down into components and then here you see the same view of the application from 
a UML perspective so that you can actually connect and see as a developer or an architect that what does it mean. And this is, uh, you know, from the perspective of the how, how the packaging of the hybrid does, you know, come back as a product, whether it's a module or extension or accelerator. And here we are going at the deepest level of uh, this uh, architect that how does now it means to me a, from every design pattern and, uh, and then look into that hybrid implementation is. So component-based architecture where I was showing all of those uh, layers. So you can think of that those layers, they are actually talking from the a presentation perspective to the process flow component to the business view logic and all the way to data access. So this is a design pattern which we are aware of it and within from the hybrid standpoint of view. So here, a, I have given all the benefits, you know, the limitations, you know, what what we have to be careful about, you know, and uh, and then some of uh, the things how the hybrids in favor of those benefits are hybrids may be lacking. So they, there are there are many things, uh, you know, a, I have found within hybrids uh, which probably are not uh, so hybrids is not every in every a construct of uh, of the component, I will not rate it, you know, 10 out of 10, you know, somewhere it is 10 out of 10, somewhere it is five or somewhere it is seven. So, so, so most of uh, those things are basically uh, shown here as the limitations of it and what we should have to be careful about. So architectural paradigm encompasses, encompassing, you know, object oriented approach to software development. It does, you know, make sure that your interface remains independent of your implementation so that you can have multiple implementation of the single interface and through abstraction, you know, you bring it together. And uh, this is exactly, you know, hybrids also does, you know, most of the hybrids, you know, when you will start looking into it, so the ways of spring injection, so you know, the hybrids show them as aliases. So that aliases is basically one name where the underneath implementation you can change keeping the alias same. So you, when you are going to overwrite any component, you know, that's what you do. You know, you go with your writing your own component and then you give the same alias. So during its runtime, you know, hybrid since it looks into the alias, so it's going to actually use your implementation and overriding or, or just ignoring the one which uh, is out of the box or something which you have overridden it. So going further, a data management, you know, what does mean from the hybrid uh, perspective? So this now, it goes back to the data modeling I was talking about and uh, how does, uh, you know, we view it if, and how, do, how, how does, you know, we see. So from the pattern perspective, it's a, it's a technique, you know, from the perspective of managing your master data, it's basically a single, golden copy are we source of records and how do we maintain it whether it's say your product or it's a customer or it's pricing or it is your catalog or it is categories there are many of them right so now a there are there are many means a, where this pattern dictates that how a data should be managed so when we look from the hybrid implementation standpoint of view a hybrid uh, a come with a type system so so the type system is basically like uh, the ones which gives you the ability that you follow a particular schema and then you device your entity model and the relationship within the entity following the schema rules. And uh, once your schema is ready, just like if you are saying, okay, this is my product I want to represent. So you will say, okay, product attributes, attribute type, these are the rules, these are the modifiers on that. And you can extend one you know, entity by another schema rule where you can say, okay, now I am writing a product which is my medical product or it's a pharma product or it is now my a product which is more tailored to a, you know, my, you know, tire industry or it is more pharma media or so, so any, any, any way you want to brand it. The meaning is you can extend it. So, so hybrids a, actually take that a whole definition, consume it, and then it's actually going to go and uh, compose them as their own 
proprietary entity model. So you can equate it through a similar to JPA, you know, where the JPA entities are there. So when you define your JP entities, you know, there you say, okay, this is my cable name, this is what. So, so Hybris underneath does very similar thing where it creates those entities and then through the persistence engine, you know, it's going to manage those entities and give you that uh, services, all of the crud based services it provides along with other searching part of it. And it keeps though that uh, type system. So when you go into Hybris, you will see that uh, because it keeps the metadata of uh, all the entities which it had so that you can go and grab and take a look at it. Let's move on. And uh, so services based integration. So now it's not just uh, within a, the context of a runtime hybrid, which is actually running within the servlet engine. You know, here we are also talking about a integration with uh, a, our peripheral system, you know, integration with uh, a, you know, SAP, integration with our payment, integration with our a delivery, our third party, our cloud-based. Uh, so there are, there are many means by which we want to remain in touch with a, all the ecosystem where the systems and application for our vendors and our partners, they actually contribute a two one information from the customer perspective. Customer doesn't care, you know, from where the information is coming. So what they care is about, okay, you know, I want to, I, I, I'm looking at this product, I want to find the customer reviews, and, but they don't realize that the customer reviews probably is coming from some third party service. So, so this pattern gives you that uh, how those uh, services from the asynchronous base, so synchronous services, real time services. So Hybris, you know, have Data Hub, Hybris has come out with another signature product called, you know, SAP Cloud Platform Integration where you know they are actually exposing their C for HANA where you have marketing, you have your hybrids running on the on your you know cloud and then SAP running in your with a network, you know, how does it communicate? So a uh, but implementation wise data hub versus you know your this uh, uh, SAP cloud uh, platform integration Integra from the platform perspective they are very, very different. You know, I will take you know one full webinar to talk about that in detail. A data hub is uh, a develop using a model where it's more like a mapping model where you actually a compose from the data, you convert the data into composition, then you take into the target and, and basically like, you know, you reduce a mapper and it's uh, based on an actor model, uh, which is the implementation does is it uses a, from the perspective of uh, a, you know, non a, um, interrupted uh, IO. Uh, devices. So, but uh, was SAP cloud integration is uh, is built upon a camel, Apache camel, where it provides you the ability where you can use those DSL uh, engine services uh, where you can say, okay, my endpoint from here to this, it goes from there. But overall, the perspective is within the context of Hybris, a services uh, integration is based through a spring. When we go through the async base, uh, you know, a, from the consumption as well as, you know, sending something to SAP, Hybris has the means by Data Hub where we can have those IDOCs, we can consume it, we can send orders back to a SAP systems. And uh, from the cloud perspective, we have the means by which we can use SAP cloud integration platform a, to communicate between our cloud and non-cloud applications. <clears throat> Content search, I already talked about it. It's, it's uh, a Apache solar based. And uh, so from our a perspective of uh, that, how does it work from the pattern perspective? It's, these are all the rules and the benefits along with the uh, hybrid implementation. It uses solar. Out of the box extension, there are three main extensions, you know, solar facet search, solar server, solar facet search, HMC. HMC is now being, uh, you know, going, uh, uh, being obsolete, you know, it was replaced by back office. So eventually this extension will be replaced by, you know, solar fast search uh, back office. But uh, what's critical to us is that, uh, to know that uh, what Hybris does. So Hybris now use a complete REST-based uh, solar six uh, services. And uh, it actually, uh, simplify how the queries be made to solar. And uh, so any of the 
a data which we want to search our product on, you know, Hybris internally creates the solar query and then it submits the solar query to the solar engine and the response when it comes back, as I was talking about those translator and transformation, a, that the stream of response which comes back, it translates that response into a, into, you know, what is suited to a web page or a mobile device, what we are looking into it. So let's move on to this one. So metadata management, very similar to, you know, how the data management works, you know, because type system and how hybrids use their type system and creates the metadata. And, uh, and because all of your rights and the access, everything is driven by the metadata management, you know, what hybrids does, because without the knowledge of uh, the type system, it won't be able to uh, provide you the access right to, uh, to the entities it's, uh, it's giving you the governance about. Uh, business process engine uh, used to have, now they have actually included uh, activity as part of BPMN. Uh, it's basically rule engine from the pattern perspective and uh, prior to six, uh, still there are few references where a spring-based uh, uh, workflow engine is there, but activity is uh, the main engine being put into Hybris. Uh, this is HM, you know, Spring MVC composite application framework, working with the Spring Core to do all the rendering part. Business activity monitoring, there is not much Hybris provides, you know, but uh, it can be created. There are all the events which get generated with the Hybris, so we can capture those events and some of the GMX means uh, has been uh, exposed by Hybris. I am pretty sure, you know, a more and more it will become a more mature in this space and uh, we should be able to monitor uh, within the context of Hybris as well as uh, integration wise, you know, what's, uh, what's being happening between those third party systems. Integrated rights management, every entity a, any of uh, a, the metadata which we want to a, serve that is uh, being uh, through integrated right management. A, this is again, a, you know, all the stuff, how it basically using the type system and put a security on top of it. Role-based access management, does it provide, you know, it's it fully role-based. Business rule engine, it uses, uh, you know, a, a you know, and that uh, from the JBoss uh, rule engine, and uh, that's what it's uh, all based upon uh, uh, rule stuff, you know, where you have your promotion rules and all those kind of logic, you know, it will uh, help you to create those rules. File transfer hot folders, uh, all based upon a uh, spring integration. Deployment, won't spend much time, already talked about it, and, uh, that was it. So summary, we all know that uh, why it is critical and hope uh, I was able to make a point that uh, uh, through many perspective of the architecture that why it is critical, but bringing back the attention again, that the more time we actually develop some good understanding about it, the better for us is to leverage uh, this, you know, I, I really love this uh, platform and uh, it, it has uh, a many critical component. I think the more we become a, a, you know, savvy about knowing that what those uh, things are, you know, the better we will be able to utilize it. So with that, I will get it back to uh, Kaisha and Kevin. And thank you everyone, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ravi. So we've had uh, just a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one of them is, what databases are supported by Hybris? So Hybris, uh, uh, when it uh, on premise, you know, it is uh, any database which is a relational database. You know, I have uh, seen, I have used uh, for our local development MySQL, but when we go into the cloud version, the cloud version only support uh, a HANA uh, database. So. Okay. Uh, so, so that's the answer, you know, so whenever we are taking our deployment and deploying it on the cloud platform, so at the end of the day, all that schema, it actually get transformed into HANA database. But uh, your local development can be 
anything from Oracle to MySQL or any of the database of your choice, which is a relation database. Okay, we have um, one other question that came in it was, um, it's with SAP Hybris, is it a good solution for a company that's maybe just starting on their e-commerce journey or offering that? It's a, it's a very good question. And uh, the answer is uh, if uh, you come from a house uh, like uh, where you see that your business processes are really very complex and you, have, uh, you want to serve a big community of your customers, uh, I think uh, uh, in that case, you know, you see that, you know, within three to five years, you will grow leaps and bounds on your digital platform. And, uh, and then you can actually, so this provides you a, a, a bad, you know, which is a plethora of uh, a business functionality and the models as well as the capability technically to grow. Uh, so, and it is uh, latest with uh, the industry standard in terms of uh, a technologies, you know, what it uses. Now I have also seen the companies where, you know, there are, a other products, you know, which uh, uses a different technology set. But coming back to this, I will say, you know, a looking into your roadmap of uh, how do you see that uh, if you see that, you know, you have a very compelling online omni-channel story and you have going to actually have this uh, customer, big customer base with a lot of orders, uh, this product and platform uh, is, is, is the right choice to go with. Okay, great. All right, well, I think those are um, all the questions we have time for now. If um, you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us. Um, we, when we'll respond to those via email. And I wanted to invite everyone to join us for the third um, part of our webinar series on the successful hybrid implementation. And we will be covering development and operations for SAP Hybris. And the key takeaways will be um, managing your SAP Hybris cloud, best practices, and Hybris system landscape and tools for automation. So thank you so much for joining us today. You guys have been a fantastic audience. And we look forward to having you join us um, for the third part of the series. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Take care.